The Federal Aviation Administration presents the new FAA Airworthiness Management Program called Regulations for Professionals, FAR Parts 1 through 91. This program will explore the history, format, and purpose behind Federal Aviation Regulations Parts 1, 11, 21, 39, 43, 65, and 91. Why should aviation technicians study the regulations? Because every profession, Major League Baseball players, emergency room doctors, or aviation technicians, must have and follow a set of rules. Rules that establish a standard of conduct for each profession that help develop mutual trust between the members of that profession. Whether we like it or not, Uncle Sam is directly involved in establishing many of these rules. They're found in the 50 titles of the federal regulations. Federal Aviation Regulations, the rules governing aviation, officially got their start with the Air Commerce Act of 1926 and were called, appropriately enough, the Air Commerce Regulations. In 1938, the Civil Aeronautics Act was passed, which created the Civil Aeronautics Authority. In 1940, because of the war in Europe, the two-year-old authority was reorganized into the Civil Aeronautics Board and the Civil Aeronautics Administration. New rules were called the Civil Air Regulations, or CARs. Then in 1958, the Federal Aviation Act established an independent federal aviation agency. And from 1960 to 1965, the old Civil Air Regulations were recodified into the existing Federal Aviation Regulations, or FARs. But in 1967, the Department of Transportation Act was passed, and the agency became an administration in the new department. But the FARs kept their name. Today, Federal Regulation Title 14, Aeronautics and Space, Volumes 1 through 3, contain the Federal Aviation Regulations. Title 14 is broken down into progressively smaller units. Chapters are the largest unit, followed by subchapters, parts, subparts, and finally the smallest units, sections. For example, to learn what FAR 39.1 has to say about why airworthiness directives are issued, first look in Title 14, Chapter 1, Subchapter C, titled Aircraft, Part 39, titled Airworthiness Directives, Subpart A, titled General, Section 39.1, Applicability. The regulations covered in this course are FARs 1, 11, 21, 39, 43, 65, and 91. Have you noticed that they're all odd numbers? and that FAR Part 43 has 12 sections and 10 are odd numbers? The reason is that when the old CARs were created back in 1926, the designers started with number one and skipped over the even numbers to allow for additions to the regulations so that new regulations on similar subjects would be close to one another. The system worked and has continued in today's FARs. But we digress. Let's do a 100-hour inspection of the regs, starting with FAR Part 1, Definitions and Abbreviations, which is really only an aviation dictionary. For example, Part 1 defines maintenance as inspection, overhaul, repair, preservation, and replacement of parts, but excludes preventive maintenance. 
and preventive maintenance as simple or minor preservation operations and the replacement of small standard parts not involving complex assembly operations. There are 150 definitions and 81 pilot-oriented abbreviations explained in Part 1. Terms like major repair, major alteration, appliances, approved, and acceptable will be discussed later in this course. How is an FAR changed? You change a regulation like you change a tire. An FAR is changed with another regulation. FAR 11, General Rulemaking Procedures, tells you how to change the tire, uh, or regulation. Section 11.25, Petitions for Rulemaking or Exemptions, is one of the most important rules in FAR 11. This rule has specific instructions on how you can petition or request the FAA for an exemption to an existing rule or even to create a new FAR. It would be wise if you read Section 11.25. So far, our 100-hour inspection of the regs has covered an overview of the FARs. Their history, starting with the Air Commerce Act of 1926, through the Department of Transportation Act of 1967, to today's regulations. We learned that a regulation with an odd number means an original regulation, and that even numbers indicate newer regulations. We also looked at the design of the regulations, from chapters, subchapters, parts, subparts, to individual sections. We learned that FAR Part 1 contains 150 aviation definitions and 81 abbreviations and that Part 11 tells you how to petition the FAA to make new rules, change existing rules, or permit an exemption to a rule. So far in our 100-hour inspection, we've picked up the keys and have run up the engine prior to putting it on jacks. It's now time to pull off the inspection plates. FAR Part 21 is the nuts and bolts section of the Federal Aviation Regulations. It describes how we certify aircraft and their related parts. But before we open up Part 21, here are several tough questions for you. What's the purpose of an aircraft inspection? To ensure airworthiness of the aircraft. And what does the FAA mean when they say an aircraft has to be airworthy? It's an aircraft that meets its type design and is in a condition for safe operation. And where do we find this definition for airworthiness? Two places. Airworthiness is defined in a law called the Federal Aviation Act of 1958. For you hangar lawyers, you can find that in your nearest aviation law library. But for the hard-working aviation technician, it is item five of the standard airworthiness certificate displayed in the cockpit of every general aviation and air carrier aircraft. Another question. Who is primarily responsible for keeping the aircraft in an airworthy condition? For Part 91, general aviation operations, the owner or operator is primarily responsible. But for Part 121 and 135 air carrier operations, the certificate holder is responsible. And here's the last airworthiness question for a while. Where can you find the requirements for maintaining an aircraft in an airworthy condition? It's printed on the airworthiness certificate, item six, terms and conditions. Quote, unless sooner surrendered, suspended, revoked, or a termination date is otherwise established by the administrator, this airworthiness certificate is effective as long as the maintenance, preventive maintenance, and alterations are performed in accordance with FAR Parts 21, 43, and 91 as appropriate, and the aircraft is registered in the United States." Unquote. Now that we understand that maintaining airworthiness is the underlying purpose of FAR 21, let's see how it relates to aviation technicians. First of all, FAR Part 21 says that type certificates are documents issued by the FAA to an applicant who has proven that the aircraft 
or the aircraft engine or the propeller meet all applicable FARs pertaining to that product. This chart should help explain the type certification procedures. To obtain any one of the three type certificates issued under Part 21, the manufacturer must provide all pertinent data to support the type design application. Depending on the aircraft, engine, or propeller being built, the manufacturer must ensure that requirements of other FARs are met. For example, let's take a small two-place fixed-wing trainer. The manufacturer must comply with Part 23 for the airframe, Part 33 for the engine, and Part 35 for the propeller, along with Part 36, noise standards, before a valid Part 21 application can be made. And only then will the FAA issue an airworthiness certificate for the one aircraft. If you wanted to produce the aircraft in quantity, you would have to apply for a production certificate. As you can see, getting an aircraft design from the computer to the ramp takes time, a lot of time. Type certificates contain such type design requirements as air speeds, RPM, horsepower rating, passenger seating, life-limited parts, required equipment, and other important information. In other words, type certificates have important information you need to perform a valid airworthiness inspection. Where can you research specific information on type certificates for aircraft, engines, and propellers? You should have, in your shop, FAA type certificate data sheets, FAA type specification sheets, and aircraft and engine listings for each make and model aircraft that you work on. And remember, there are separate listings for older aircraft in which 50 or less aircraft, engines, or propellers are in service. The most current information is found in the six volumes of FAA type certificate data sheets. Volume 1 covers single-engine airplanes. Volume 2 is small, multi-engine airplanes. Volume 3, large, multi-engine airplanes. Volume 4, rotorcraft, gliders, and balloons. Volume 5, aircraft engines and propellers, and Volume 6, aircraft engine and propeller listings. Here's an INAT, an important notice for aviation technicians. Type certificate data sheets are periodically revised by the FAA. You must have the latest revision to make a valid airworthiness decision. Aviation technicians can purchase separate volumes or the entire set from the Superintendent of Documents, U.S. Government Printing Office, Washington, D.C., 20402. Another question. Can the type design of an aircraft, engine, or propeller be changed by someone other than the manufacturer? Yes. Type design can be changed by a supplemental type certificate an FAA Form 337 major alteration by field approval or by an airworthiness directive. Let's look at an STC, a supplemental type certificate, which is an FAA approval to make a major change to the type design, but the change is not great enough to require an application for a new type certificate. An example would be installing a higher horsepower engine that was not listed on the type certificate for that particular aircraft. Using the FAA Form 337 as a field approval for a major alteration is another way to change a type design. There are three kinds of field approvals. First, there's the approval by examination of data only. This approval is for both major repairs and alterations to one aircraft. Next is the approval by physical inspection or demonstration. This is for major alterations to one aircraft only. And finally, the third Form 337 approval is approval by examination of data only for duplication on identical aircraft by the same modifier. This approval is only for major alterations. But remember, 
The FAA may approve the data and the ANP may perform the work, but it's the IA, repair station, or air carrier who actually approves the product for return to service. Airworthiness directives, the third way to change type design, will be covered in greater detail in the next section. Now let's look at the aircraft parts and equipment approval process under PMAs and TSOs. A PMA, or Parts Manufacturer Approval, certifies that the manufacturer part complies with FAR 21.301, all applicable airworthiness requirements, the material in the part meets design specification, the part meets design and construction requirements, and is marked in accordance with the FAR. PMA is required for all replacement or STC modification parts that are to be used on a type certificated product. But there are four exceptions. Parts produced under a type or production certificate, parts produced by an owner or operator for maintaining their own product, standard parts like aviation quality nuts and bolts, and parts built under a technical standard order or TSO. A technical standard order is a minimum performance standard for specific articles like seat belts, avionics, and life preservers that are used on aircraft. In summary, FAR Part 21, Certification of Parts and Products, sets up the procedures for type certificates for airframes, engines, and propellers. The three ways we can change type design are STCs, Form 337 field approvals, and airworthiness directives. The parts manufacturer approval, PMA, and the technical standard order, TSO, are the two common forms of FAA approval for aircraft parts. ADs are issued by the Federal Aviation Administration when an unsafe condition exists in an aviation product or that condition is likely to exist or develop in other products of the same type design. It's very important to remember that each airworthiness directive issued against an aircraft, engine, propeller or appliance is an FAA regulation and that every airworthiness directive is a mandatory maintenance action. There are three ways ADs come into being. The emergency AD, the immediate adopted rule, and the notice of proposed rulemaking. The emergency AD is effective immediately. The immediate adopted rule is usually effective in 30 days or less, and compliance is required within a short period of time. And the notice of proposed rulemaking is the normal process for issuing an AD. This includes the proposed AD being published in the Federal Register, followed by a public comment period and a review of the comments. The AD is then either issued or withdrawn based on the comments and review. Airworthiness directives are found in two volumes. Small Aircraft and Rotorcraft contains all ADs for aircraft with less than 12,500 pounds takeoff weight and all the ADs for rotorcraft regardless of weight. The second volume, Large Aircraft, contains all ADs for aircraft with a certificated takeoff weight of 12,500 pounds or more. Just a little, each volume contains two separate books, numbered books one and two. Book one of each volume contains all ADs issued prior to 1980, while book two of each volume contains all ADs issued after January 1st, 1980. In case you're wondering, any changes to an AD listed in Book 1 will be published in the bi-weekly supplements to Book 2. Airworthiness directives in each volume are divided into four categories. Airframe, power plant, propeller, and appliance. The same appliance section is duplicated in both the small aircraft and rotorcraft volume and the large aircraft volume. Each individual AD has three main parts, the identification number, the applicability section, and the compliance section. The identification number is really an index. 
Take, for example, AD 900315. 90 is the year of original issuance. 03 indicates that the AD is in the third bi-weekly period, and 15 means that this is the 15th AD in that bi-weekly period. When the letter T precedes the AD number, it means that the AD was issued as a telegram to the owner or operator. The letter R and a number after the AD number indicates the number of times the AD has been revised. In this case, AD 90-03-15R2 has been revised twice. Speaking of revisions, and this is important, because it's not uncommon for a revised AD to call for additional maintenance procedures, it must be complied with and signed off even if the original AD had a one-time compliance requirement. The applicability section specifies the product by make, model, or serial number to which the AD applies. The compliance section sets the time limit for you to comply with the AD. It can be a one-time only requirement on a specified hourly basis, number of cycles, or over a calendar time period such as annually or monthly. Compliance can even be a combination of hours and calendar time. Here's an obscure fact. It is possible to have an AD against an aircraft or product which was manufactured after the date the AD was issued. For example, an airliner that comes off the line in 1990 might be subject to a 1989 AD calling for a special 500 cycle landing gear inspection starting with 1989 serial numbers and up. In summary, airworthiness directives ADs apply to all aviation products. ADs are issued when there is an unsafe condition or when an unsafe condition is likely to exist or develop. The three ways ADs come into being are emergency AD, immediate adopted rule, and notice of proposed rulemaking. All ADs are in two volumes, small aircraft and rotorcraft, and large aircraft. Each volume contains two books. Book 1 holds all the ADs prior to January 1980. Book 2 contains all the ADs issued after January 1st, 1980. And finally, the AD number is broken down into three parts. The year, the bi-weekly issue, and the sequential number in that bi-weekly issue. FAR Part 43 covers maintenance, preventive maintenance, rebuilding and alteration in only 12 regulations and 6 appendices. For the purpose of this presentation, we will break FAR Part 43 into 5 major elements. Applicability, authorized persons, approval for return to service, performance rules, and record keeping. The first element FAR 43.1, applicability, pertains only to aircraft having a U.S. airworthiness certificate, excluding experimental aircraft, and foreign registered civil aircraft used in FAR Part 121 and 135 operations. FAR 43.3 allows only authorized persons to perform maintenance, and they are airframe or power plant mechanics, persons working under the supervision of a mechanic or repairman, repair station repairman, an air carrier, and pilots doing preventive maintenance on their own aircraft, which are operated under Part 91. FAR 43.3 also permits a manufacturer to rebuild, alter, or inspect only the aircraft product for which they hold the type certificate production certificate, technical standard order, or parts manufacturer approval. The third element, FAR 43.5, talks about approval for return to service after maintenance, preventive maintenance, rebuilding, or alteration. To approve an aviation part for return to service, 
you must have a maintenance record entry required for work performed under either section 43.9 for maintenance or 43.11 for inspections. And if the work is a major repair or alteration, an FAA form 337 properly filled out is also required. And in some cases, a flight manual change may be needed. FAR 43.7 is titled Persons Authorized to Approve Aircraft, Airframes, Engines, Propellers, Appliances or Component Parts for Return to Service after Maintenance, Preventive Maintenance, Rebuilding or Alterations. They include A&P mechanics, IAs, repair stations, manufacturers, air carriers, and private pilots working on aircraft which they own or operate. Question. Since mechanics, repair stations, air carriers, manufacturers are authorized to approve an aircraft or aviation product for return to service, who actually returns the aircraft or aviation product to service? The answer? The pilot in command of the aircraft when it is taxied out with the intention of flight. The fourth element of FAR 43 is record keeping. FAR 43.9 gives you, the aviation technician, the requirements for record entries for maintenance. All maintenance entries must include a description of acceptable data, the date work was completed, and the name and signature of the person performing the work. Air carriers' maintenance record entries are made in accordance with each company's manuals. Here's what a sample maintenance entry looks like with the date, acceptable data, and the name, signature, and certificate number. For major repairs and alterations, Maintenance record entries must have two signed FAA Form 337s. One is for the owner, and one must be in the FAA district office within 48 hours. An exception to the 337 rule is that if you install extended range fuel tanks in an aircraft's baggage or passenger compartment, you must fill out three 337s. One for the owner, one for the FAA, and one for display inside the aircraft. Now let's talk about yellow tags. Most people think that the tags themselves are the maintenance release issued by the FAA approved repair stations for major repairs and are used in place of the FAA Form 337. But the information on the yellow tag is only one part of the maintenance release. Appendix B of FAR 43 says that a maintenance release has two parts. One part is a signed copy of the customer's work order, and the other is the actual maintenance release statement, which is either on the yellow tag or simply stamped on the work order. Both parts must identify the product that was repaired, and in the case of an aircraft, it must list the make, model, serial number, nationality, registration, and location of the repaired area. If the repaired item is an airframe, engine, propeller, or appliance, the release must have the manufacturer's name, name of the part, model, and serial number. And finally, the maintenance release must include this or a similarly worded statement for the approval for return to service. Take a few seconds to read this sample release. FAR 43.11 lists the requirements for record entries for inspections. The entry must describe the type of inspection, the date, list the total time in service, and the signature and certificate number of the person performing the inspection. There are all kinds of inspections, but the most common are based on hours, as in 50, 100, 150 hour inspections, calendar, as in annual, six month, or 18 month inspections, progressive inspection, an annual type inspection spread over a period of a calendar year, part 91, large aircraft or turbine aircraft inspections, and 
special inspections like hard landings, corrosion, fire, or lightning strikes. Here's a sample inspection entry for an airworthy aircraft. The aircraft is identified by N number, date, total time, the kind of inspection that was performed, and the name and certificate number of the person performing the inspection. Here's a statement you use for an unairworthy aircraft. Note that a list of discrepancies and unairworthy items must be given to the owner or operator. For you IAs out there, even if you sign this aircraft off as unairworthy during an annual inspection, you will still get credit for that inspection for your IA renewal in March. Just in case you think that's as far as record keeping goes, there are additional record keeping requirements outlined in FAR 91.417. This reg requires that the aircraft owner operator permanently retain certain maintenance records and transfer them when the aircraft is sold. Those records include total time in service of the airframe, each engine, each propeller, rotor, and appliance, current status of life-limited parts, time since overhaul on all items requiring overhaul, notification of current inspection program and time since the last inspection. Those records also include current status of AD compliance and recurring action, copies of FAA Form 337 for each major alteration of the airframe and for the current engine, propeller, or appliance. Further guidance on maintenance records, including procedures for replacing lost records, are in Advisory Circular 43.9b, Maintenance Records. In closing this lengthy record-keeping element, let's review the appropriate FARs. FAR 43.9 covers maintenance record keeping, 43.11 inspection record keeping, and FAR 91.417 covers retention of aircraft maintenance records. Let's take a break now, and when you come back, we'll finish up FAR 43 by looking at performance rules. So far, we've looked at four of the five major elements in FAR 43. Applicability, authorized persons, approval for return to service, and record keeping. The fifth element, performance rules, FAR 43.13, sets the standard of workmanship that the aviation technician must meet for maintenance and inspection. It requires that you use manufacturer's instructions acceptable techniques and practices, and that the work must be at least equal to the product's original or properly altered condition. This rule is so important. Let's take the time to read it carefully. FAR section 43.13a. Each person performing maintenance, alterations, or preventive maintenance shall use methods, techniques, and practices prescribed in the current manufacturer's maintenance manual or instructions for continued airworthiness and other methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the FAA. Use tools, equipment, and special test equipment recommended by the manufacturer. FAR section 4313B reads, each person maintaining altering or performing preventive maintenance shall do that work in such a manner and use materials of such quality that the product worked on will be at least equal to its original or properly altered condition. FAR section 43.13c reads, maintenance performed in accordance with a maintenance manual or section in an air carrier's operating manual constitutes an acceptable means of compliance with FAR 43.13 performance rules. The rule helps you understand what is meant by confusing words and terms like acceptable and approved, major or minor, or the term data. For example, let's look at FAR section 43.13a again. 
you must perform maintenance, alteration, or preventive maintenance in accordance with the manufacturer's maintenance manual or other methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator. That means data. Now, let's define data. FAR 4313A says that when you perform maintenance, you must use the manufacturer's maintenance manual or other methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator. In other words, you must use data. But there are two kinds of data, acceptable data and approved data. Acceptable data can be manufacturer's maintenance manuals, manufacturer's service bulletins, advisory circulars 43.131A or 43.132A if applicable, or FAR Parts 121 or 135 maintenance manuals. Acceptable data applies to all maintenance, repairs and alterations except major repairs and alterations. Approved data can be type certificate data sheets, aircraft specifications, supplemental type certificates, airworthiness directives, or manufacturer's FAA-approved engineering orders. And approved data can be drawings or instructions from an FAA-designated engineering representative, DER, or a designated alteration station, DAS. An appliance manufacturer's manuals can also be considered approved data, even though the manuals are not specifically FAA-approved. Advisory Circular 43.131A, titled Acceptable Methods, Techniques and Practices, Aircraft Inspection and Repair, can be considered approved data for major repairs if three conditions are met. First, if the information in the AC is appropriate to the product being repaired. Second, if that information is directly applicable to the repair being made. And third, if the AC information is not contrary to manufacturer's data. You must use approved data for major repairs and major alterations. This mandate is clearly spelled out for the IA in FAR 65.95, for the air carrier technician in FAR 121.379, for air taxi personnel in FAR 135.437, and for the repair station repairman in FAR 145.51. Right up front, let's define major and minor. A rule of thumb is that major repairs or alterations are those that might either appreciably affect the airworthiness of the aircraft or when the repair or alteration cannot be performed in accordance with accepted maintenance practices. Everything else is considered minor work. If you read FAR Part 1 definitions, you'll see that major repairs and major alterations seem to be very similar and take at least 40 words to explain. But the bottom line is, a major repair will restore the aviation product to its original design standard. But the major alteration is a change to the aviation product form or function not spelled out in the original design standard. Additional help in determining the difference between a major repair and a major alteration is in FAR Part 43, Appendix A. FAR Part 43, Appendix B will tell you how to record both major repairs and major alterations. Guidance on filling out an FAA Form 337 for major repairs and major alterations is found in Advisory Circular 49.91E. Since it's you, the aviation technician, who has the authority and the responsibility to decide if a particular repair or alteration is a major or minor one, you must become familiar with FAR 43, Appendix A and B, and AC 49.91E. FAR 43.15 covers additional performance rules for inspections. For example, the aviation technician inspecting a rotor craft must follow the manufacturer's recommendations for the inspection of the drive shaft or similar system, the main rotor transmission gearbox, the main rotor and center section, and the auxiliary rotor. 
FAR 43.15 also requires that during annual or 100-hour inspections for any aircraft, the technician must run up the engines according to the manufacturer's recommendations. In this segment, we've covered the five major elements of FAR 43. Applicability, authorized persons, approval for return to service, record keeping, and performance rules. We also covered the definitions of major and minor, repairs and alterations, data, the differences between acceptable data and approved data, FAR 43 appendices, and those advisory circulars that help you comply with FAR Part 43. Mechanic certification is found in subpart D, Mechanics, of FAR Part 65, Certification of Airmen Other Than Flight Crew Members. Some of the eligibility requirements for mechanics are 18 years of age, able to write, speak, and understand the English language, and all tests must be completed within a 24-month period. There are two ratings for mechanics, airframe and power plant. A properly rated mechanic under FAR 65.81 may perform maintenance, supervise maintenance, perform preventive maintenance, or make alterations on an aircraft or product. Under FAR 65.81, a mechanic may not repair or alter an instrument or make major repairs or alterations to a propeller. A mechanic may not supervise work unless he has satisfactorily performed the same work before and a mechanic may not perform the work unless he understands the current instructions of the manufacturer. This next regulation is too important to be overlooked. FAR 65.83 states that an individual is not qualified to work on aircraft unless the FAA has found that the person can do the work or unless the individual has either served as a mechanic for at least six months out of the last 24 has technically supervised other mechanics or supervised in an executive capacity the maintenance or alteration of aircraft or a combination of all the above. FAR 65.91 could be called the Master Technician Regulation because it sets the requirements to hold an IA. FAR 65.91 says that you must have been an A and P mechanic for at least three years and have been actively working on certificated aircraft for a two-year period. You also have to have had a fixed base of operations and have the necessary equipment and data to function as an IA. And you must pass a real tough written examination. FAR 65.95 permits an IA to inspect and approve for return to service any aircraft or product after a major repair or alteration perform an annual inspection, or either perform or supervise a progressive inspection. The IA card must be available for inspection, and the mechanic cannot exercise the privileges of the IA after moving to a new location until the nearest FAA office has been notified in writing of the move. FAR 65.92 limits the authorization duration to one year with all IAs expiring on March 31st, regardless of the date the IA was issued. The IA card can be suspended or revoked by the FAA for cause. And if the IA no longer has a fixed base of operations, equipment, or data to perform IA activities, the card must also be surrendered. An inspection authorization can also be surrendered voluntarily by the individual. To meet renewal requirements for an inspection authorization, an IA under FAR 65.93, a mechanic must perform one annual inspection for each 90 days that the authorization is held, or perform two major repairs or major alterations for each 90 days, or perform or supervise one progressive inspection, or complete an approved eight-hour refresher course or take an oral test from the FAA, 
only a few mechanics take this last option for renewal. Here are some additional FAR Part 65 regulations that cover alcohol and drug use by mechanics. Under FAR 65.12, a mechanic convicted of alcohol or drug abuse can be denied application for a rating or certificate for up to one year, or his certificate can be either suspended or revoked. Under FAR 65.23, a mechanic who performs maintenance under FAR 121, Appendix 7, and refuses to submit to a drug test can be denied an application for any certificate or rating up to one year, or have his certificate suspended or revoked. FAR 65.21 requires that if you have a change of address, you must notify the FAA within 30 days. Notification should be sent to Airman Certification Branch, Post Office Box 25082, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73125. In Part 65, we covered eligibility requirements, the two mechanics ratings, privileges and limitations of mechanics, the inspection authorization, and drug and alcohol rules. FAR Part 91, titled General Operating and Flight Rules, sets the requirements for inspections and record keeping for general aviation operations. On August 18, 1990, FAR Part 91 was recodified. The majority of the regulations dealing with inspections and records are now in subpart E titled Maintenance, Preventive Maintenance, and Alterations. FAR 91.403 states that the owner or operator of an aircraft is primarily responsible for maintaining that aircraft in an airworthy condition. FAR 91.409 covers annual, 100-hour, and progressive inspections, plus the four inspection programs for large multi-engine turbine-powered aircraft. An annual inspection must be accomplished within a 12-calendar month period. It's required for most FAR Part 91 operations and some Part 135 air carrier operators. It must be signed off by an IA or by a repair station or by the air carrier. Any work accomplished must be done in accordance with FAR Part 43. The 100-hour inspection is similar to an annual inspection in scope and detail. It must be signed off by an A&P mechanic, repair station, or the air carrier. It's required for aircraft for hire. A 10-hour extension to the 100-hour requirement allows the aircraft to reach a maintenance base. Like the annual, the progressive inspection must be completed within a 12-calendar month period. It must be consistent with the manufacturer's instructions. And if the inspection is discontinued, the owner or operator must notify the local FAA district office. After the progressive inspection is discontinued, the first annual inspection is due within 12 calendar months after the last complete inspection of the aircraft. FAR 91.409 paragraph D covers the instructions on how to get an operator on a progressive program. The operator must make a formal request to the local flight standards district office to start the inspection program. The A&P mechanic, repair station, or manufacturer of the aircraft who will supervise or perform the inspection must be identified at that time. Then the operator must supply a current inspection procedures manual with an explanation of the progressive inspection. And finally, the inspection procedures manual must include the inspection schedule in days, hours, or cycles and also the appropriate instructions to fill out the progressive inspection forms, reports, and records. FAR 91.409, paragraphs E and F, cover inspections of large airplanes or turbojet or turboprop multi-engine airplanes and an optional inspection program for turbine-powered rotorcraft. The owners or operators of these aircraft must select an inspection program from the four options listed and must identify the specific program in the aircraft maintenance records. 
Option number one is a continuous airworthiness inspection program in current use by an air carrier which uses the same make and model aircraft. Option number two is an approved aircraft inspection program or double AIP approved under FAR 135.419 and currently in use by an air taxi operator. Option number three is a current inspection program recommended by the aircraft manufacturer. Option number four is any other inspection program approved by the FAA. FAR 91.415 allows the FAA to change the inspection program if revisions are needed. The operator can petition the FAA for improvements to the inspection program. Here are some additional maintenance regulations that are found in FAR Part 91. FAR 91.421 is titled Rebuilt Engine Maintenance Records and requires that for a zero-time engine, the manufacturer or an agency approved by the manufacturer must provide a new record with a signed statement of the date that the engine was rebuilt, a list of all applicable airworthiness directives, and a maintenance entry for each change made in accordance with a manufacturer's service bulletin if the entry is specifically requested in that bulletin. FAR 91.213 is titled Inoperative Instruments and Equipment. This regulation allows an aircraft to be operated under FAR 91 with missing equipment if an approved minimum equipment list exists for the aircraft or if the aircraft has a letter of authorization for a minimum equipment list. Or if the pilot meets the requirements of FAR 91.213 paragraph D, which allows operation without an MEL under certain conditions. Part 91 sets the inspection requirements for all aircraft operated under this FAR. We reviewed annual and 100-hour inspections, examine the difference between progressive inspections and inspections for large and turbine-powered aircraft. We also looked at rebuilt and zero-time engine record keeping and where to find Part 91 minimum equipment list requirements. This concludes our 100-hour inspection of Federal Aviation Regulations Parts 1 through 91. A challenging open book test on this presentation is available from your local FAA Flight Standards District Office. The 25 question test is on the material covered during this presentation. With a score of 70% or higher, you'll receive a certificate of training from the FAA. If you don't pass the first time, try it again. We want to issue you the certificate. Thank you for your attention.